grateful for this opportunity to come before you and share the word. I was here last week and enjoyed the, the worship and the word um, from Pastor Martin, a wonderful friend. Um, and uh, I was privileged and blessed that he would even ask me um, in his absence and in his stead to break the bread of life um, today. And so I, I don't take it lightly um, that, that, that this is um, this opportunity has come. And um, um, gonna, um, uh, you hear people say this all the time, I'm not going to be before you long. Um, <laughs> but I, I do, um, I'm appreciative of the fact that um, I met Pastor Martin um, and some of the uh, Community of Joy family uh, when we launched out together for 50K Souls. And um, that project, of course, is all about outreach. It's about sharing the love of Christ um, in the community. Um, and it's funny because we were, um, I heard his name mentioned a, a little while later um, by an, a mutual friend named Shauna Kersley when I was developing some community garden projects um, in the Princess Anne area where I work. I was a Miracle Vista um, on the UMES campus a little while back, and we, um, I decided I wanted to do some community gardening for that community. And uh, one of the first names that Shauna mentioned to me was, you've got to meet Martin Hutchison. You've got to meet Martin Hutchison. So um, we had this meeting, okay? And um, we're sitting here um, downtown, um, and we're meeting, and we're the whole time we're just looking at one another like, dude, I know you from somewhere. You know, so he's looking at me like, I know you from somewhere. I've seen your face somewhere. But of course, you know, this is Smallsbury, so you don't think much about it. It's like maybe just just a community thing, you know. Right, it could be Walmart. It could be anywhere. Um, but the more we talked, he looked at me. He said, 50K souls. I said, 50K souls. So we realized that, um, oh yeah, you know, so we realized that this was not our first meeting in this meeting and um it just it just created a greater bond and a greater connection because i realized that this man um is about community um and then to find out that the name of the church is community of joy um because that's what it's about it's, it's about community it's not just about what we do in these four walls it's about the it's about preparing in these four walls for the impact that we're supposed to have out there and um, I shared earlier that, and I often, often share this, and again, sometimes people get offended when I ask this question. Um, the question simply is, and I stood before a group um, some time ago, and I asked the question, if this church were to close its doors, never to have service again, never to come together to worship here again, would the surrounding neighborhood miss you? Would the community miss us? Um, in some cases, when I ask that question, I get this blank stare. In some cases, when I ask that question, you know, you get the sucking of the teeth. And um, in some cases, I ask that question, it's just kind of like that, that say la moment where it's like, wow, I didn't think about it like that. Um, and fortunately, in sometimes some places where I ask the question, the answer is absolutely yes, because we do what we're supposed to do in the community. But the point is not to try to bring anybody down and not try to put anybody on levels or not to be critical of church, kingdom or ministry, but to point out the fact that we have an assignment that is not stay here, but go ye. We have an assignment that calls us out to where they are. And sometimes, unfortunately, we don't do enough of that. So if the doors of the church were to close and the community doesn't miss us, then that means that we've not made enough of an impact on that community. That means that we've done a disservice to the community and to the body of Christ because that's where they are. And Jesus commanded us to go to where they are. Okay, so um, I'm grateful to know that um, there are ministries, there are people who have that mindset, who have that, who have that desire, that, that, that drive, that burn to go and reach them where they are. Amen. So um, when Pastor Martin, when Pastor Martin asked me to come 
um, in his in his stead today. It was absolute yes. Uh, I was I was again I was I was really just like wow really dude you want me to come and then he was like and I'm not gonna be there I was like wait hold up hold on you you want me to come and you and you're not gonna be there um that's a that's a that's a that's that's like a serious trust thing I'm like wow dude you really want me to come not just not just with you but instead of you really wait <laughs> um so but I'm 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 I, I find it and I count it an honor and a privilege to do so. And hopefully, um, he'll ask me to come again. <laughs> so I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up. No, but seriously. Um, but again, I, I'm honored to be here and it's good to see everyone. Um, so we're going to go ahead into the word. The scripture was read. Um, and I want to just kind of look at some things in this scripture. But let's first, let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time that we're here together. We thank you for the word that we're about to break. We thank you for the bread of life. We ask, Lord God, that you feed us till we want no more. We ask that you have your way in this place. I humble my heart before you, Lord God. Let your words be my words. Be pleased with all that I do and I say. Open up the minds, hearts, and ears of your people that we might be blessed, Lord God. Fill us, nurture us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're in Luke chapter 15, verse 11 is where we start. And this is a familiar story about what we've known, what we've begun to know as uh, the prodigal son. Okay, so um, I kind of want to touch on a couple of things that I've noticed in the scripture because it's in those quiet times, in those study times, sometimes that God gives us the opportunity to read it again for the first time, kind of opens up and, and re-enlightens us on some things that we've kind of sometimes scape over when we read it just kind of like haphazardly, uh, but but sometimes in those in those quiet times and when when we actually give God an opportunity to talk to us and we just sit still and listen, um, he begins to point out some things and certain things just kind of like um, jumped out in the scripture. And um, I just want to share a few things. And there, there are four particular things that I'm going to talk about in this in this passage of scripture. One is entitlement. The two is um Wastefulness. The third thing is realization. Um, and four and five together are, I'm sorry, maybe I should say four is a kind of a two part thing of repentance and redemption. OK, so we have entitlement, wastefulness, realization, repentance and re re repentance and redemption. All right. So I want to first start with the first part. Uh, best place to start is at the beginning, right? Um, so I want to talk about entitlement. I would look, when I looked at this relationship between this father and his son, one of the things that I noticed is that this young man only appreciated his relationship with his father based on his father's adequate and abundant provisions. He was living at home, grown man, living at home, um, still living with his father. Um, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, because what, what, we'll, what we'll think about later on is that he was the youngest of the two. And then there was an older brother, an elder brother who was living at home, growner than the grown one, still living at dad's house. Now, traditions, times, you know, it's a whole different thing. So we're, we're, again, we'll, we'll table that for another discussion. Um, but he was living at home. Home symbolized a place of safety, a place of comfort, a place of provision. He, this is where this young man um, was living, he, and the father was providing adequately for his son, as a good father does. Um, however, this young man didn't see the full scope of what his father was doing for him. All he saw was the stuff that daddy gives me and what daddy does for me, not realizing the sacrifices that have been made, the wheeling and the dealing, the, the hustle and the bustle the blood, sweat, and tears um, that go into making a house a home um, and the things that go into providing the comforts for our family. And if we have any parents here, we have any anyone here who works and you do it all for your family, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's, there's, there's that effort, that drive, the thing that keeps us moving and motivated is the fact that 
If I don't do this, then my children won't have. If I don't do this, then my family won't have. So these are the things that keep us moving um, as parents, right? So again, unfortunately, this young man at this point in the relationship didn't appreciate that. Um, So as we go on in the story, we realize that, you know, just again, uh, The only thing that we're asking for or the only thing that a good parent is asking for when this opportunity comes for the person who's receiving is to simply show that you appreciate it. When when you when somebody does something good for you. We've been trained from here, these babies, we teach them now when someone gives you something, you simply say thank you when someone does something kind for you. Uh, you show appreciation for it, right? Um, but again, unfortunately, in, when, when you have an entitlement mindset, um, as this young man did, he didn't truly appreciate the whole scope of who his father was or what his father was really, uh, what a good father really is and what a good father really does. Um, at this point, all this young man saw was daddy gives me stuff. Um, he only saw his father's hand, but he d- he never took time to know his father's heart. Entitlement. He had a sense of it belongs to me whether I've earned it or not. And we're living in a time now where we see it more and more. People are they're 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 motivated and driven by what they can get. Um, and people want reward without work. We see it as as time goes on. We, uh, people want instant gratification, reward without labor, a lot of a lot for a little and trophies for everyone. This is a time that that everybody gets a ribbon, everybody gets a prize, everybody gets a trophy. Even if you haven't put forth your best effort, people still want rewards, entitlement. Um, the value of work ethic and learning and earning have gone out the window. And when you live that way, nothing is ever enough. Nothing is appreciated for long periods. Sometimes. You, you, you ever been at a place where you've given somebody something and before they can, before you, you feel like they should value that, observe it, look at it, be in awe of it a little bit more. And, and, and no sooner than you give it to them, they're looking for what's next. Ever, ever had a person who was, um, and and you know, the feeling of that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uncool feeling. It's like, wait a minute, dude, I, 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 I work several hours for, you know, this is like, and I was sharing earlier that sometimes um, when I see my, and I, I don't want to put my kids on the spot, but, um, um, <laughs> but, but I mean, and not just them, but we have older kids. And this was a lesson that we, I had to teach uh, one of my older sons and um, that when we buy you games and I see them on the floor with the working side down, meaning that they're going to be all scratched up and damaged and everything else. You see that as a game. I see that as money laying in the floor. Yeah, you know, I mean, and these are these things, these things are like 60 bucks a piece. So you calculate that by the number of hours, of the, the dollar amount that you get paid per hour. And if you, let's say if you're getting paid $10 an hour, that's six hours on the floor. That's six hours of my labor, six hours of my work on the floor. So yeah, you, you see it as, as a toy, you know, something colorful, these little trinkets, but I'm hearing like the, 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 yeah, cha-ching, the cash register thing. And I'm like, wait, and then there's another one. That's 12 hours of my work. Here's 18 hours of my work. Wait, dude, but this is 24 hours of my work. This is a whole day of work laying in the floor. Actually, four days because we work three days because we work eight hours a day or more or less. So, so you see my point. You see my point. But so when we when we live that way, we don't learn to appreciate the value of what's been given to us. Entitlement. Okay. So, and what entitlement leads to? Um, is desiring more. This is not enough. I want more. So this is where this young man was. Um, nothing is ever enough. And that's where he was. And, and he got to the point where even, even his father's daily provision 
of stuff wasn't enough. Um, so he went to his father and asked him. He said, Dad, it's taking you too long to die. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so if you could basically give me, if you were to die today, whatever your net worth is, can I get my part? Um, entitlement tells you that you that you that you deserve something that you haven't even worked for or earned. Entitlement tells you that I don't even have to wait for this. Um, and this is where this young man was. So he's like, can you, can you give me my part? If you, I, I don't want to wait anymore. It's taking you to, I, I, I want to, I have a life I want to live. I have things I want to do. Um, could you give, if you were to die today, let, let, okay, dad, let's just say you were dead. Give me what your worth would be, or give me my half of what your worth would be, because I know what you're going to do is you're going to split it between me and big bro. So let's say you're dead. Okay. I, I need my half. Can I get my half now? How hurtful a thing is that to say to a father who's giving you everything already? How hurtful a thing is that? Um, what a slap in the face this was to this father to say that your current givings to me with my grown self are not enough. I want more. How hurtful a thing would that be to say to a father who's providing who's working, who's laboring, who's giving, that what you're handing me right now, I know you got more. Give me more. I want more. But this is what he said to him. So, but being the good father, the good, kind, loving father that he was, he gave it to him anyway, in spite of what he knew the outcome would be. So, the other the thing that entitlement leads to, unfortunately, is wastefulness. Entitlement leads to wastefulness because when you haven't earned, when you haven't worked for it, when it's been handed to you, when you haven't learned to appreciate it, the, appreciate the value of it, you don't appreciate the value. So you waste what's been given to you. When we when we given time and we don't value the, the, the we don't appreciate the value of time, we waste it when we're given money. And we don't appreciate the value of money. We waste it. And I often say, I, again, this is one of the things that I say to my kids and to the community and people that I work with and share. With the way that you spend your money is the way that you'll spend your time. If you're wasteful with your time, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. But the way that you spend your time is the way that you'll spend your money. So you might not have money right now. But when you get it, how you spend your time is the same way that you'll spend your money. If you're wasteful with time, if you're always late for everything, if you don't take time to plan ahead, if you don't take time to be on time or, or work towards being early, the way that we spend our money, our time is the same way that we'll spend our money because we'll be late with our bills. We'll be late with um, um, paying, uh, paying our debts. We'll be late with getting things done. We'll be late with our time. I'm sorry, our money the same way that we are wasteful with our time. Make sense? So this young man, because he didn't learn the value of uh, working and work ethic, he became wasteful. And it's, the story goes that um, as soon as his dad gave him his stuff or the half that he felt entitled to, he began, he, he moved to a far off place. He took off, bounced, rolled out, bounced like a bad check, just gone. Um, now, and it's, the scripture says he didn't waste a whole lot of time. So he had this plan in mind because it says not many days later he left. So he already kind of had a game plan. So he was thinking ahead. <laughs> wow. Ironically, the one thing that he was thinking ahead about was being wasteful. Uh, so <laughs> go figure. Um, so he rolled out not many days after. Um, and this, the things that I want to point out real quick here are one, it says he went to a far off country. So he went far away from home far away from safety, far away from the will of his father. Um, he went far away from his purpose. He went far away from, from provision. He went far away from the plan, okay, that his father had for him. And it also points out that he wasted substance with riotous living. So he did total opposite of what he's used to um, and what he knew was right for him, okay? Um, and sometimes we, we, maybe I shouldn't say we, but 
Uh, I'll speak for me. Uh, I can remember a time where when I got out of the safety net, I had to be the wildest. I had to be the loudest. I had to be the, uh, the, 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 the one that had to be seen because I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was no longer attached to that place or that, that people, that person. Um, so he had to show out and he had to show the world um, who he was or who he was pretending to be. The other thing that it says is that he spent all um, and there he spent all and there arose a famine. OK, so in this particular point, um, what it shows, again, wasted time, wasted money because he didn't spend time with the father learning business, learning strategy. When the time came for him to have his own money, he wasted it and didn't learn how to prepare for what could happen. So when the famine came, he had, all his money was spent. Um, and as I stated earlier, how you spend your time is how you spend your money. So all that time, all that time he spent in the father's house, never learning the father's heart. Um, and then the point, then the other thing after that is he joined himself to a citizen of that country. So not only did he step out of the will, but he got stuck there. Not only did he step away from safety, but he had to, he, ha he got stuck out there and had to join himself to a citizen of the country where he lived. So what this points out, no doubt, is that um, because of debt or because of poverty or because of not knowing how to make a living for himself, he had to become an indentured servant or slave um, who had to work for food and shelter to pay off a debt or to pay for a way of living. Um, and the, the crazy thing about the scripture also is that he found himself, when he attached himself to this citizen, he, the one thing that he was instructed to do was to go out and feed the pigs, feed the swine, go to the pig pen. Um, and we know traditionally, um, Jews had nothing to do with pigs. Okay. We understand that, that they were considered unclean. They were considered un impure. They were considered unholy and that Jews were not supposed to touch. And even now, um, many don't eat pork. Okay. Um, because the swine or the pig is an unclean animal to them. Okay. So, he found himself in a place where he was touching the unclean. Um, and he, what's even worse is that he found himself in a place where not only did he have to go out there and feed the pigs, but he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. Anybody ever been around a hog pen? Anybody ever been around a pig pen? Listen, I couldn't eat good food around that smell. But you're going to tell me that not only was he was he desired to eat what they were eating. Another thing that you need to understand about pigs, they're a filthy animal and they eat. And they excrete. In the same place. Yeah. Yeah. So so he desired to eat. So basically what I what I what I noticed in this is that outside of the will of God. Never say what you won't do. Because the reality is, if we're outside of the will, we'll do the very things that we never thought we'd do. We'll find ourselves in a place where we'll be, we'll be doing the unthinkable, touching the untouchable, indulging in the undesirable outside of the will of God. But thanks be to God that verse 17 shows us that he came to a place of realization. He came to a place of remembrance. He sat in there in this pig pen and he came to himself, as the scripture says. The NIV says, when he came to his senses. I visualize this young man sitting there with his toes, clothes all tattered, man, unmanicured fingers, um, barely wearing any clothes, no shoes, um, desiring to eat pig slop. And he thought to himself, how did I get in this place? My father has servants who live better than this. 
I may not, not I may not be able to get back in my daddy's good graces, but I know I don't have to live like this. I can go and be a servant of my father and live better than this. So he came to a realization. He came to a place of remembrance. He remembered all the things that his father had been trying to teach him. He remembered all the things that his father had been trying to show him. He remembered all the blessings and all the all those things that sometimes it takes us to find ourselves in a dark place before we begin to take value in those things that we used to overlook. Sometimes it takes us to be in a place of loneliness to take value in the friends that tried to be friends uh, with no ulterior motive. Sometimes it takes us to be in a place of lack and of debt, of brokenness, to find ourselves appreciating the value of money and of time. Sometimes we have to find, sometimes we find ourselves in, uh, it's in the, it's in those worst places that we find ourselves appreciating the things that we once didn't. Am I making sense? So this young man found himself there and he found himself in a place where he had to make a choice. He had to make a conscious decision at this moment. Do I stay here or do I swallow my pride? Do I stay here or do I make things right with my father? Do I stay here or do I get up from here? And go forward. And he made the choice when he came to him, to him, to his senses. He made the choice to arise and go back to his father. He had one of those aha moments. He had one of those snap out of it moments. Um, he realized that he was in a far off place, um, from where he belonged and remembered, he remembered who he was and he remembered whose he was. So he arose from the pig pen and ran back to his father. And the most beautiful part about this whole scripture is that his father was waiting to receive him. His father never gave up on him. His father never lost hope in the fact that my son one day will come to his senses and return. This is a very, very very familiar passage of scripture. And... Um, it shares a story of poor choices, wild living, forgiveness, and redemption. It shares a story of grace. Um, and in my years of looking at this story, I kind of paid attention to the to all the characters, but mostly the young man and the father. Now, from a natural sense, of, and as a father, you look at this story and you say, if this kid had appreciated, um, if he had appreciated his father, his life wouldn't have been so bad. But then the realization hits me that in this story, I'm not the good father. I'm the entitled son. I look at my life and I look at how I've been guilty of that sense of entitlement. I've been guilty of that wanting the father for his stuff and not really understanding how to build and develop or desiring to build and develop a relationship with him. Um, In my walk with Christ, I've had those moments um, where I only wanted and needed God for his abundance of stuff, his blessings, whether it be financial, the job, the car, the house, his healing when I'm sick, his rescue when I get myself in stuff. God, if you get me out of this, God, if you do this for me one last time, I promise if you, if you, God, God, if you, if you let me get through this, I won't, do it again. Anybody ever been? <laughs> okay, okay. Maybe, maybe it's just me. I, uh, but but you find yourself in that place and you begin to realize that that is a sense of entitlement. That's a sense of wanting his hand, but not his heart. Um, and just like a good father, even in those times, he still provided for me. He still looked, He still took care of me. He still winked at my ignorance. He still had hope and a belief and a a knowing in his knower (laughs) that I was going to get it together. I was going to get it right. He didn't give up on me. Hallelujah. So. Because I didn't learn his heart, I was wasteful of my time, my blessings, my, my, and I, I, I wasn't appreciative of it. 
I was wasteful of my focus and the plan that he had for me. But thanks be to God, he allowed me an opportunity to come to my senses. Um, I remembered who I was and whose I was. And in spite of the mess I was in, he still loved me. In spite of the choices I made, he still chose me. In spite of the length of time that it took he, to get back to him, he waited. And he stood there with outstretched arms to welcome me and receive us all um, and call us his own. Because he's a good father. Even when we haven't always been the best of children, he's been a good father. So my encouragement to each of us is to come to the realization um, that the father is waiting for us. Not just for salvation, because typically we share this story when we're talking about bringing people back to the Lord. And this is this is adequate for that. But what I've also realized is in my life that I didn't I, I left God. Even though I didn't leave the church. There were times that I left God. And never left the house of God, never left the presence of God's people, never left. Uh, never walked away from, I, I was still, I was still saved. I was still called, still chosen, still doing church stuff, still praying, still reading my word, still fellowshipping. But I was not in the place that he called me to. Sometimes we can find ourselves in what I like to call a comfort zone where we get comfortable doing the church thing. We get comfortable doing the good thing but not the God thing because just because it's the good, it's a good thing to be in the house of God. It's a good thing to read the word. It's a good thing to pray. It's a good thing to, to read scriptures. It's a good thing to fellowship and all those things are great. And that's a part of our walk. But when God has called you to a higher vocation, when God has called you to what he wants you personally to do, the, 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 the plan that he has specifically for your life, that passion, that burning, that drive to go and do outreach, that passion, that burning, that drive to, to do whatever area of ministry it is. Not necessarily have to be behind the podium, doesn't have to be a preaching, but there's something that God has called us to. And none of us have time to sit on our hands because we're all called to work. As I said earlier, um, not everybody's going to preach, but everybody is called to be a witness. Everybody is called to the go ye ministry. Right. So sometimes we can do the good thing. And it not be fully God's will because we're not doing everything that he's called us to. So even in that, we've strayed away. Even in that, we find ourselves comfortable doing something over here, knowing that God has called us to do a work over here. And that's still walking away. So we can have a we can be saved and still have a prodigal son heart. We can be saved and active in ministry and still have a prodigal son heart, demeanor, attitude, because we don't want to do the more that God has called us to. Am I making sense? <laughs> Basically, yeah. So, I mean, so a disobedience is disobedience, whether it be um, not being said, you know, not, not accepting Christ as Lord and Savior or not accepting the work that he's called us to. All right. Um, so. It's time to realize it's time to arise. It's time to get out the pig pen and get aligned to the father's plan for us. Remembering who you are. Remembering who you're connected to, remembering who you whose you are. We're a royal priesthood. We're king's kids, y'all. We are we are chosen vessels and he has a plan a desire, a design, and an assignment for each of our lives. And, you know, we have a work to do. And it's time now more than ever before to get aligned to the assignment and get moving forward. Amen. So, um, remembering who we are, remembering whose we are. God bless you. Um, I guess this is that fun part of. Did you want to start? Or did start. you did you have something? 